be recording. There we go. Okay, Dr. Christoph Strobel is a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, where he teaches various courses in the global and native in global and Native American history. His most recent book is Native Americans of New England. He is also the author of The Global Atlantic, 1400 to 1900, The Testing Grounds of Modern Empire, and co-author with Alice Nash of Daily Life of Native Americans from Post-Columbian through 19th Century America. Christoph has also published three books on immigration and his scholarly essays appear in many academic journals and in various edited collections. Tonight, he presents Beyond the Mayflower in 1620, uh, Native Americans of New England. Um, he will present an interpretive history of the indigenous peoples of New England. This talk will not attempt to provide a comprehensive history, but rather by focusing on a few select case studies, historic sketches, biographies from throughout New England, we will explore the story of Native Americans in the region. While this talk will not turn a blind eye to the horrendous impact that colonization, dispossession, and racism had on the lives of indigenous people in New England, it will also emphasize Native American resistance, adaptation, and survival under the often harsh and unfavorable circumstances. I am so happy that you could all join us tonight for this incredibly important talk, especially given that this is um, National, National Native American Heritage Month. Um, and we're so pleased to welcome Dr. Christoph Strobel online with us. If you have questions, uh, please send them to the chat or use the Q&A module and we will try to, or, um, try to answer them um, as best as we can. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming out. Uh, the Zoom reality is always somewhat uh, difficult. Uh, I've just given one in-person talk a few weeks ago, and it was kind of very nice to actually see people, and everyone was masked up, but it, it was still nice. But uh, for now, I think this is still part of our reality. Uh, I would encourage you, any questions, put them in the chat. We'll answer every question. I might be able to stop here and then. Uh, Jessica will chime in if there's question and, and bring them in. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor to be part of this, uh, the incredible speakers. Uh, Anuan Whedon just two weeks ago was just so charismatic and, 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 and just wow. So it's always a hard, hard number to follow him. Uh, and then Claudia Fox Tree and Debbie Irwing. I'm sorry that I will be missing that talk uh, because I have a have a prior uh, talk out in Western Mass. Um, but uh, thank you so much for everyone to come out tonight. And uh, I think we'll just step into uh, into the uh, history and what we're going to do, especially today, is talk about Native American survival. But we're also going to talk about history and also some of the colonial legacies that have uh, shaped this history of ours. And so um, what I don't like about the Zoom reality is you're completely and utterly in the dark. So I am flying blind. I don't see the chat or see any faces, but it's all right. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is the visible legacies that that still come uh, with this history of colonization. And every time I walk out of my, uh, my uh, office, which I am in right now, uh, I look at the, uh, the flag of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it's, it's, it's a reminder how much that history is with us today still. So the concurrent uh, seal of the state of Massachusetts is uh, based on that of the, the 17th century seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And of course, in this picture, you see a almost naked Native American covered with some leaves, and he has this speech bubble come out of his mouth that says, come over and help us. And we've had a few seals in between that, but in the late, uh, mid, late 19th century, um, there was a re so let's try this again. So we are, we are here now with the two seals, the 17th century one, the come over and help us seal. Um, 
And I, I, I do this every semester with my students and they're always shocked by that. And then we'll look at the, the contemporary Massachusetts seal that's been under fire for quite a while by indigenous activists and, uh, and, and, and Massachusetts residents that have a lot of problems with the seal. And that's what I wanna explore a little bit because I'm always, uh, talking to students, but also when I do these library talks, the, the seal of Massachusetts is something I like to talk about because for one, it's about these visible legacies that are still with us, but it's also uh, amazing um, how uh, very few of us actually know what the seal stands for and, and what the problems are with the seal. So let's look at the seal and the person of the Native American. Uh, so there's a body. Uh, that, that body is based on an archaeological find of a Native American of human remains uh, found in Winthrop, Massachusetts. When the seal was designed in the second half of the 19th century, uh, while there were indigenous communities in uh, Massachusetts, um, the um, designer decided to um, go with the face of a Native American from Montana. So you kind of have this Frankensteinian Native American body, disjointed head. Uh, you put the sword on top of that Native American head. That is the sword of a fellow named Miles Standish. And uh, depending on the age of the audience, uh, if you went to high school in 1650s, you you probably read Bradford Plantation. You are familiar with Miles Sanders as the person that um, was sort of the military uh, advisor to the Mayflower colonists. And he was the first military leader of Plymouth uh, Plantation or Plymouth Colony. So, um, and in one of the very first engagements with Massachusetts Indians, there, were, there was a Native American that was decapitated uh, and then his head was piked outside of Plymouth Plantation. Uh, that was actually pretty normal in warfare at the time. Uh, but it's understandable that already knowing that the body and head are kind of disjointed and that the sword is placed above, it, it does give a pretty bad flavor for our, to like, the symbolism of the seal is just kind of really uh, bad in that way. Now it gets a little bit more gruesome. The the bow the person is hold, uh, that Native American is holding is based on a bow. You can see that at the uh, Harvard Peabody Museum. Right? That's where it's located. Uh, that was uh, the bow of a Native American that was killed outside of Sudbury in the 1650s. You look at the belt in the image that is based on King Philip's belt that's in the same Harvard Museum. And King Philip as well was decapitated after a war in the 1670s. And his head was also piked outside of Plymouth and was left up for um, about two decades. So it must have been quite the gruesome sight. Uh, also note the seal of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, by the sword we seek peace. Uh, it's supposed to be a revolutionary reference, but just like the head, the sword above the head and by the sword we seek peace, as we'll explore a little bit later in the talk, it also leaves a bad taste in the mouth of a lot of indigenous people or, or people like me that, that are aware of the history and the history of violent conquest that has happened in, in New England. And so it's a very sad history, but it's also, I think, like the seal, is something that we need to know about uh, to create a better future. And there is some discussion now to uh, change the seal around. Uh, I think this was supposed to be uh, some recommendations were supposed to be done in October, but I think the, me, the, the, the committee only met one time, and I think they're way behind on, on making decisions and recommendations. But sort of, this will probably, 
the CO might change in the next few years. We shall see. Um, any questions so far? All right. Nothing so, so far. Excellent. Oh, there's something in the chat. Perfect. Oh, here it uh, is. Oh, you're surprised we didn't uh, begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we could have. Uh, land acknowledgements are, um, they're kind of a contentious issue. Uh, there is a lot, of, there's a lot to be said in positive uh, aspects of our land acknowledgement, but several of my indigenous friends also are quite critical of land acknowledgements, uh, that they look at them as, as an empty gesture. So, uh, Yes, the Andover Town Seal is definitely problematic. And, and while we're at it, the, 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 the Chelmsford Town motto as well, let the, let the children guard what the sires have won is also quite problematic. So we have a bit of a, of a history of these bad slogans and problematic slogans that we tend to not think about, but they come out of a, like a, a very violent history of, of, of conquest and, and so on. And so, yes, uh, we could have started with a land acknowledgement. Uh, 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 the, the question, how did you come to this work? What, what do you mean by, by, by work, Brenda? All right, maybe that's something we'll pick up in the in the, uh, Brenda, maybe you could uh, clarify that issue and then we'll pick it up in the, in the Q&A at the end. I will also okay. um, just say that um, currently uh, Chelmsford is working on a land acknowledgement with the um, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee yeah. and, um, and the town of Chelmsford. Um, we're, we're, we're working very hard on it and we hope that we will be able to include something um, uh, Ex acceptable um, in in the near future. Yeah, and I think it looks good because I got to I got to take a sneak peek, and I wrote one for my university, and it's also um, a bit uh, it's a very arduous process with many many uh, stakeholders, and I'm glad to hear that uh, Andover is working on the town seat. Uh, no, I don't have any personal or family history in, 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 that, in, that, in that area at all. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so um, let's maybe move on and uh, look at some of the intellectual legacies. Uh, when we deal with Native American history and the way it is written in New England, it is often sort of, informed by these myths of wilderness, uh, virgin land, nomads. I mean, this is when you read 19th and early 20th century histories, local histories or hi history that, that talk about Native Americans. Native Americans are frequently vilified. There are, um, the landscape here is described as a wilderness, a quote unquote virgin land, and Native Americans are depicted as sort of hunter and gatherers. And that really does not speak to the long and complex history uh, uh, prior to colonization that exists in New England and really all over North America. New England in particular was a region of ecological stability. So when you look at the um, um, the early colonists account, they talk about the rich resources in fish, wildlife, uh, farming. Uh, they're incredibly socially complex societies. They are societies also based on agriculture. So especially in Southern New England, these, the communities are agrarian. Um, yes, there is hunting going on in indigenous communities, but that has to do more with the lack of domesticate, domestic, sorry, with a less lack of domestic animals in North America. So Native Americans have the dog, which they domesticate. Uh, Native Americans in Latin and in, in the Andes, they have the llama and the alpaca, which they domesticate, but there's just not many animals uh, that can be domesticated in the Americas. 
So what Native Americans, in, in a, as a way to get protein in their diets, they need to um, um, they need to hunt. But we tend to think of hunting and as going out in the woods, and that is part of it. But but what also happens in north in 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 the eastern woodlands, so the, the region east of the Mississippi, there's also a lot of landscape management. So there is, is controlled burns to like space out the trees to take care of the underbrush. So in a sense, yes, it's hunting, but there is a lot of landscape management that is going on there uh, that fa facilitates easier hunting to na Native Americans. So in a sense, just like European farmers raise pasture lands to, to feed their animals. Native Americans uh, change their landscape uh, to um, spur their animal population and manage their animal population. New England is part of a long distance exchange network that ex extends over the entire North American continent. Uh, wampum is one of the things that, that is being traded in these exchanges. And we have over 10 millennia, at least evidence going back 13,000 years of human history. It might be way more than that. I'm gonna just take a quick look at uh, where tribes in New England matriarchal. Uh, matriarchal is maybe the wrong term here. Matrilineal is the... Uh, maybe a, a more accurate way that the lineage goes through, through the women. Uh, so not quite like the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois of New York, but there are certain elements and, 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 and the role of women is certainly more pronounced in New England societies. Uh, oh, how did they know which animals, fruits weren't poisonous and venomous? Uh, long trial and error. Our human ancestors, and their development of agriculture, like using tiny kernels like this and turning them into corn, uh, they have done some fantastic work and it took thousands of years and trial and error and probably spitting out a lot of food. Zoe, uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any other questions. I don't think so. Uh, so, Let's move on to the slide and please keep the questions coming because they, uh, oh, there's one more in the chat. Uh, when did European introduce, uh, that happens at least in the, probably as early as the uh, 16th, but especially in the 17th century. And, and Venetian glass beads are quite, uh, quite uh, popular there, Catherine. I'm trying to, uh, there we go. There's other legacies of colonization and survival in the indigenous Northeast. Um, the story that we're often quite familiar with is that of the dispossession of land and the dismantling of Native American communities. Another side of the story that we're not often talking about as much is that of slavery. And um, the history of American slavery I would argue is very intrinsically tied to the history of New England. And it's also uh, tied to the history of the colonization of Native American people. Um, so slavery happens or the, the way that slavery shows up in, the, in, in New England history is uh, first in the 16th century, when we have the first slave raiders capturing Native Americans, who they then sell on the slave markets of the Atlantic world. Uh, one example of someone that was captured as a slave, uh, or at least was intended to be captured as a slave, is, this, is of course, Squanto, or as, as he's most often known, uh, but I will be using his, his uh, not his diminutive name, but, but his, uh, his, the, the name Tisquantum. So Tisquantum was one of several Native Americans that, that was captured in 1614 and was tried to be sold on a slave market in Spain. And uh, he was 
freed by a group of Franciscan friars and through various ways through uh, by being placed as a as a servant in the house of a, a, a wealthy English investor who was part of uh, the investment companies that were running a lot of businesses in, in New England, uh, made his way back uh, to New England. Uh, one of the captains uh, tried to take Tusquantum with him and try to negotiate a peace because a lot of the native communities in New England have been quite upset with the English for raiding for a lot of slaves and that undermined the fur trade. And so what this officer decided to do, Captain Dermer, is take Tusquantum as a translator. In a long fight, make a long story short, Tusquantum was sprung free uh, and then ended up uh, at Plymouth Plantation, uh, helping out the, uh, the colonists, learning how to farm, uh, learning how to navigate the weather. But, but what he also did is he introduced the New English uh, to um, navigating the coastal waters. In fact, he died during one of those missions when he taught uh, the, the English how to navigate the coastal waters uh, of disease in these early 1620s. But this is not the end of the story of slavery. In the 1630s, we also have this event called the Pequot War, and which is a very bloody and nasty event in, in American history uh, that includes incredible massacres. To make a long story short, the Pequot had a, had a very powerful role in the wampum trade. And historians argue back and forth and have killed many trees, publishing boring books of how influential this, um, this, their position was in this wampum trade. But the English were trying to get a piece of this wampum trade. Now wampum is, uh, and I think to, to those of you who were at the, at the talk with Anawan, he, he held up some of them. Uh, they were used as currency by the colonists uh, and uh, were not only used by, as currency and as a means of exchange by Native Americans going all the way to New York and beyond, but they were also started to be used by the, by the New English in the 17th century as a, as a form of currency because there was a shortage of coins until at least the 1650s and 1660s. To make a long story short, it's a very bloody, violent war with lots of tiny battles, some big massacres. Um, and the New English and their Native American allies win the war. And as a compensation, they take many hundreds of Pequots uh, as war captives. Some of these war captives are sold on the slave markets uh, of the Atlantic world. And there they are exchanged for enslaved people from Africa that are being brought into New England. But what happens too with the presence of these uh, Pequot war captives, the New English elite starts to talk as like, well, the Romans had war captives, right? And they called them slaves. And so what happens by the early 1640s, uh, Massachusetts, becomes the first English speaking colony in North America that puts a system of slavery on the law books. And this history of colonization, the Pequot War uh, plays an important role. But Native Americans alongside people of African descent make a large portion of the enslaved population in New England. And it, it, it's a, through the 17th century that the Slave, enslaved population of, of Native Americans is in fact larger than that of people of African descent. And so there's a lot of intermixing between people of African descent and Native American descent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other story, of course, uh, is that of disease. I did mention, oh boy. I, sorry, I did mention uh, that Native Americans did not have um, many domestic animals. And so what happened uh, 
is that they did not have immunity to a lot of the disease. It's now it happened again. Sorry. Um, let me just not touch this. Um, so let me try this again. Uh, because of the lack of domestic animals, the disease landscape that had developed in North America or in the Americas overall was quite different from that of uh, Africa, Europe, and Asia. There had been trade going back and forth, domestic animals. So there had been a, a much more, a much different disease environment that had emerged in Afro-Eurasia. And what ended up happening is that a lot of these diseases made their way across not only with the colonists, but already before the colonists came. So there's likely quite a bit of mortality in New England going on in the 16th century, and it seems to escalate in the 17th century. So when you look, for example, at the Merrimack River Valley, uh, it is quite likely that by the 1630s, uh, and especially by the 1670s, about 90% of the indigenous population had perished as a result of colonization. Now, disease is a big factor there. Slave raiding and warfare are other factors there. Uh, and so disease makes an important, uh, plays an important role in the history of New England Native Americans as well. But there's also a lot of adaptation by indigenous people resilience and throughout their history and into the contemporary, uh, Native Americans have survived and, and, and uh, persisted. By the sword, we seek peace. I wanna just speak very briefly about war in New England and the role it has played in the colonization. I'm putting some numbers up roughly by the 17th century, New England's population was probably 140 to 120,000 Native Americans. By, this, by 1670, that number had shrunk to about 30,000. Now that's estimates uh, and, and, and they're kind of tricky, but um, here we are. Um, by the 1670, the colonial population had already been over 50,000. And so there's a lot of tensions and there's a lot of blame to be, go, to be going around and the colonists blame Native Americans and Native Americans blame the colonists. Uh, but what ends up happening in the mid, mid 1670s, there's this event called King Philip's War that break, or that we today call King Philip's War that breaks out. And that is an incredibly, bloody warfare on both sides. It's by all numbers in terms of the impact that it has on the Euro-American or New English population or on the Euro-American population. It's the most violent conflict in American history when we look at mortality uh, rate compared to population size. So yes, of course, the Civil War is more bloody, but if you look at mortality of population and population size, King Philip's War is arguably the bloodiest war. It's even deadlier, it's even more deadly for Native Americans. Some historians in recent years have estimated that seven out of 10 Native Americans in Southern New England are killed as a result of King Philip's War. Other historians have argued it's 50%. But whatever it is, it's an incredibly high number. Uh, when there was already a very much depleted population, uh, it, it, it only becomes worse after King Philip's War. Now, the way the story is often told, it's like it's a conflict between Native Americans and English, but that the English got a lot of support from Native American allies. For example, the colony of Connecticut has strong support from the Mohegan and the Pequot Indians. Uh, Massachusetts Bay colonies draws heavily at the outset of the conflict from the Native Americans from the praying towns so their Christian Native American communities from throughout New England. But then Massachusetts Bay colony changes its position and it rejects Native Americans assistance, but they also start to persecute uh, Native Americans. So the uh, 
population of Natick and several other praying town communities, they are put into an internment camp on Deer Island in Boston Harbor. And uh, anyone that's been out there, this is where the sewage plant is today. Uh, we still need better signage to kind of acknowledge what happened at Deer Island. It's again in the work, but that work is slow and sometimes very frustrating. Um, Native Americans were hardly given any food. They were not allowed to cut down trees for firewood, to build shelter. And anyone that's been out there in the Boston Harbor in a winter nor'easter knows how brutal the weather can be. We do not know how many Native Americans died on Deer Island, but it is likely a large number of people. Uh, as the war was not going well for the English, eventually they asked the, pray, uh, the Praying Town Indians on Deer Island to assist them again, and the men go and assist uh, the English colonists. And I am sure in their rationalization, it is very much also, this is maybe a way to get my family off this island eventually. So it's, it's in a sense, it's a very sad history that we don't talk about much. King Philip's War also leads to an Algonquian diaspora. Many Native Americans in this area, especially in the Merrimack Valley, they flee up north. Uh, many remain or come back after the war, but it does provide a big exodus. And here, of course, also having put up a, uh, a statue of Hannah Dustin uh, as she holds the scalp. What we tend to forget in New England, we tend to have this vision of Native Americans being out there and scalping during warfare. What we tend to forget is that New England has a long history of passing scalp bounties. So that New English governments paid privateers uh, as well as soldiers or someone like Hannah Dustin, a incredible amount of money for killing Native Americans and cutting off their, their, uh, the, the hair of Native Americans and bring the scalp back as proof of, of the kill and as a way to get payment. And we have from 1670 to, uh, to 1750, there is, I think, at least 60 some scalp bounties, but this goes back all the way to the Pequot War, and it's an incredibly sad and violent history that we don't talk about much either. Um, but I also want to bring the story up to the present and I have about only 15 minutes left of talking time because I've talked, I don't wanna spend more than 45 minutes. Uh, so um, Native American survival continues. For example, in Lowell where I'm located, uh, right now, the community here, there is about 14 kids that Chelmsford settlers take in as indentured servants and take in is, of course, to be taken not lightly. What happens to these 14 Native American children, we don't know. They disappear in the records. But slavery and indentured servitude is involves the lives of Native Americans throughout the 17th, 18th, and into the 19th century. Christianity with the praying towns had been a force in Native American life, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. But what happens in the 18th century and into the 19th century, Christianity becomes also very indigenized. And so that you have, uh, people like Samson Ockham and William Apis, who you see on the picture here, missionaries and, and ministers that serve Native American communities. But they also become school teachers, teaching Native American children how to read and write. And they're also, in the case especially of William a Apis, but also Blind Joe Amos of Mashpee in the 19th century, they're also strong political activists that speak up for the rights of their people. Native Americans show up in the factories. Uh, Betsy Guppy Chamberlain, who you see on the left-hand side here, she was a mill girl in uh, Lowell uh, and uh, of Native American heritage descent. Uh, she wrote 
various pieces for the uh, New England offering and the Lowell offering. Most of her work deals with uh, women's rights, but about 10% of the corpus she produces also deals with indigenous rights. And she's a very vocal advocate. And so people like William Apis and Betsy Guppy Chamberlain, they remind mainstream New Englanders, hey, New England Native Americans are still here. New England Native Americans work in agriculture, domestic labor. There's also throughout the 19th century, you pick up newspapers. There's the stories of Indian peddlers, Indian doctors, Indian performers, and Native Americans uh, knowing uh, natural medicine, uh, your chances of going to a natural healer as opposed to a 19th century medical surgeon, uh, your chances of survival are probably as good, if not better. So there is, there, there is that. And, and a lot of the Native Americans probably deliberately put on uh, what they think Euro-Americans want to see and think what a Native American looks like. And so you have these accounts of Native Americans rowing down in ca canoes, like selling their baskets or, or other goods. Uh, and so there's, there's a little bit of marketing in, in that area. Native Americans work in construction. The river driving, logging, so getting first cutting the trees in northern New England and then bringing them down the river to the coast. Tourism trade, canoe making amongst the Penobscot and Pasmaquoddy is a big, big industry. And in the 20th, early 20th century, the best place in the world to get your canoe. Um, I am seeming to get stuck here with this PowerPoint. I apologize. The other thing that Native Americans work, industries that they work in is whaling and military service. And as you can uh, probably imagine, these are not very um, um, life ways that will bring you a long life. So the Native American mortality rate is incredibly high in the 18th and 19th century, and, and the population gradually declines. Um, but it is especially the male population that declines more rapidly than, than, than women. So women are starting to look for partners outside of their communities, and they are starting to intermarry with African-Americans, recent immigrants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it is interesting to note that the women's children, the husbands sort of function as, as adjuncts to the community, but the women still raise their kids in the community. They teach their kids language skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So inherently these communities maintain sort of an indigenous identity that even though Garnet, the designer of the uh, Massachusetts seal, didn't see that. Most Native Americans understood themselves living in a Native American community. But this is also the 19th century, a period of incredible racism. Uh, and the one blood rule, right? African American blood, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that increasingly people perceive Native Americans not being the descendants of King Philip, but rather that they have become sort of this, uh, and they have nasty words for this design that I'm not gonna use, but, but sort of that they have become so quote unquote diluted that they are now persons of color is what is often used in the documents. And that's sort of the, the quotable stuff. So, there's increasing pressures on indigenous communities throughout New England, the Merrimack Valley and throughout New England. And many smaller communities start disappearing and more and more pressure is brought onto these communities. Um, but what happens in the 186, from 1860 to 1880 is a policy of termination. And this is uniquely New England. There's termination in when you teach Native American history or you've taken a course in Native American. Historians talk about this often in the context of the 1950s. But what happens in, um, in New England between 1860 and 1880, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, the state governments decide, okay, Native Americans, 
you are no longer Native Americans. We are terminating your reserves, which is what they call reservations in New England. Uh, and you are no longer Native American. And Native Americans protest this. They pass votes, uh, but mainstream society ignores this. So while the majority of Native Americans do not want to be terminated, the state governments move ahead. Just because the reserves disappear though, Native American communities still uh, center around these communities and they just do not go away. Places like Mashpee or the Mohegan communities or the Pequot communities, the, 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 the Native Americans continue to survive and they continue to go to their churches. They continue to have Native ministers. They continue to elect tribal leaders if that works for their community. So in many ways, their societies continue in ways that they have before. And from 1860 to 1880 onwards, through the decades, Native Americans frequently in the courts try to challenge the termination by state governments as illegal. The two people I'm pulling up here are uh, Joseph Nicolar of the Penobscot Nation. He wrote a very influential book in the late 19th century. Uh, and this is again, another reminder uh, to mainstream society that Native Americans are still there. And I mean, I, I tend to like, I like reading Joseph Nicolar's book and it always reminds me like, oh, here's someone in the 1890s that kind of had an understanding that that, that most white academics didn't have until, well, <laughs> okay, uh, maybe not yet. Uh, so he's an incredible uh, writer and he brings in cultural insights uh, that are absolutely phenomenal. The other person I wanna uh, point out here, and again, they're just like Betsy, Guppy Chamberlain and Apis, they're just stand-ins for so many people that struggled and try to move their communities ahead is Gladys Tantaquidgen. Gladys Tantaquidgen was a Mohegan uh, Native American. Uh, she lived over to be over 100. She was trained as a traditional healer, but she also obtained a PhD in anthropology from UPenn. Uh, she wrote some incredible works on ethnobotany and natural healing but also very active in indigenous rights. But the other sort of side project that Gladys Tantaquidgen had is that she collected a lot of artifacts and a lot of documents pertaining to Mohegan history. And those would play an important role by the second half of the 20th century. And we'll revisit that. The other part of the legacies of colonization and the welfare of Indian children is of course, the cultural genocide that was brought on Native American children and, and, and their families. The story of the boarding schools is, is widely written about and it, it has an impact on Native Americans in New England. Um, and that's a very depressing story and like recent findings in Canada, I, I think they're just scratching the surface. And, we will, if we have honest examinations of boarding school, school sites in the United States, they're quite deadly places. I mean, even before the recent findings, Canadian scholars emphasized that it was, uh, it was safer to be a Canadian soldier fighting in the trenches to be a child in a Canadian residential school. Uh, and that certainly applies to the United States as well. So it's a very sad history. You talk to boarding school survivors, I mean, it, it breaks your heart. Uh, the abuse, uh, they can be federally run schools, but a lot of them are, are run by religious institution states. Uh, very, very depressing stories uh, when you talk to boarding school survivors. The other thing that is going on in the 20th century is that the issue of family separation. And that's another sad uh, part in American history that Native Americans are separated, children are separated from their families, mostly 
often the only reason that can be realistically given is that their parents and their children are Native Americans. And so the particular situation we have in New England is that the, at Congress passes a law in 1978 that is called IGWA. Uh, and this, uh, this law pretty much says uh, that Native American children should be placed in foster care with other Native people. Um, what happens in the state of Maine, and there's a very cool documentary out on that, it's Dawnland. I think I, I referenced that in the, in the Anawan Whedon talk, uh, but it's still on PBS. Uh, I think it will be up. I just talked to, um, to one of the, 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 the people that made the documentary. It's still up until November 20th on PBS, and then they'll take it down. So if you haven't seen that yet, it's a good, good chance to, um, to, to check out this documentary by the Upstander Project. Uh, in the state of Maine, this continues after IGWA has passed. And you have families, children separated, uh, despite it being a uh, violation of federal law. And it's been a, a big uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I wanna go back to, remember Gladys and all the artifacts she collected? These artifacts were used, for example, in the Mohegan's case uh, to get federal recognition. So the work done by activists like Gladys and many other Native American activists and their allies uh, helped many New England communities to gain federal or state recognition. But I should also say, that federal and state recognition is, uh, is certainly a reality for some Native American communities, but there are also Native American communities in New England who are neither state uh, nor federally recognized. Federal recognition is incredibly expensive. It requires resources and smaller communities don't often have the time. Plus it's a political process. It can work out, but more often than not, it can also uh, not work out, backfire, and, and be an incredible drain of resources. Indigenous activism. Uh, like for over 50 years, we have the day of mourning at Plymouth Plantation when Native Americans remind us uh, on Thanksgiving Day that there's another side of this story that we often don't talk about. Native Americans fight for economic and cultural revitalization. Like many poor rural communities, for example, up in Maine, uh, the indigenous communities up there have, indigenous leaders are constantly trying to figure out how to stabilize the economic situation. You throw in COVID, you throw in the, um, uh, the opioid crisis, which hits Native American communities much harder than uh, mainstream American communities, and, and you have your work cut out. Language preservation, for example, amongst the uh, Mashpee Wampanoags, uh, big, big, big uh, issues in that Native Americans try to revitalize their languages, keep things going. I talked for 50 minutes, that's way more than I should. And so I want to like open things up for the chat and questions, and I'm going to go on to stop share. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patience and coming out and uh, some technological uh, glitches here. Uh, mea culpa. Uh, so, um, yes. So I think earlier on, um, someone asked a question that we didn't quite get to. It was, uh, when must it natives come to an agreement with the settlers for land transfers? And that was earlier on in your talk. Okay. Can you, can you repeat um, that was, question again? Yeah, it says, it was, it was from Gail. Gail said, will Messit um, natives come to an agreement with settlers for land transfers, question mark? Do you, and um, does that sound? I'm, I'm unfortunately not familiar, but there's a lot of things I'm not familiar with. I mean, it's a very complex history. Uh, Gail, can you uh, can she unmute herself and maybe ask the question? Might be easier, but I don't know if that's possible. Let me see if there's um, a clarification. Yeah. 
sorry, Gail, I'm, I'm a little slow. It's been a long week and I'm not the brightest tool in the shed. Um, okay, the next one. Um, what do you think about, what do you think of Graeber and Wengro's book, The Dawn of Everything, which says what you were saying, upending the European definition of civilization? Yeah, it's a good, and there's a lot of interesting work done by academics and uh, partially what's frustrating is how little that seeps down, which is why I like doing these talks at libraries and, 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 and try to sort of disseminate some of that work, but it's, it's definitely a good book. Um, is it true that the European diseases were deliberately spread by the colonists? Um, there is certain... Um, times when that seems quite the case. For example, um, I mean, the, the usual example that's given here is uh, Jeffrey Amherst, the, uh, the namesake of, uh, of, uh, of, of Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, he didn't spread it directly, but one of his officers clearly understood that when he would distribute the uh, disease infested um, blankets among the Lenny Lenape, also known as the Delaware, when they were about to uh, besiege Fort Pitt, that that pretty much wiped out their resistance effort uh, or their, their effort at, at taking the fort. So there is examples of that where, where uh, disease is, is used like that. Yes. Wow. Um, Catherine asks, uh, does Algonquian, A-L-G-O-N-K-I-A-N, refer to people as tribes or language groups? And um, where, yeah, and then there's another question after that. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's, a, that's always a confusing one. So I think with the K, that's a Canadian group. And then the Algonquian with a Q is a linguistic group. So that includes people from like the Powhatan, Native Americans and Virginia Indians all the way up into Canada and, and covering much of Canada. And then a little bit south are the Iroquoian speakers like the Haudenosaunee or, 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 or um, the Hurons with, and, and then of course the Cherokee and, and so on. So I hope that answers that question. A couple of people wanted to know um, uh, regarding the Hannah statue. Um, where is that statue? And is it this one standing? Yeah, this one, I, I dragged my girls out to that one. They were not happy. Uh, this one is uh, outside of uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly put on the site on the island where Hannah and her two allies dispatched of an old Native American man, a um, one man that was a fighting age that was sort of left there for security. And then they killed, I think, six children and several women and then scalped them and, and took the thing. And again, I mean, I'm sure like she was taken a captive, it's a traumatic impact. And so, but yes, but then there's also the scalping that they take that and, and she, she made quite, uh, her and the other two captives made quite a bit of profit. Um, and we have like these Lovewell from, from Nashua up the river, Ting, uh, Captain Ting from Tingsboro, uh, Spencer, who Spencer is named. We have quite a few New England towns that are named after people that were just scalp hunters. And they were going out and trying to kill Native Americans, often women and children, uh, and taking their scalp and, and getting paid for that. God, it's incredible history. Sorry, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, and so we tend to not, like we tend to connect scalping with, and especially in New England, that is uh, an underexplored history and it's, it's part of my current project. And in fact, the Upstander project is just doing a, um, has just done a, um, a, a their, their latest project is uh, called Bounty and that deals with the scalp bounties and especially in, in regards to the Penobscot community and sort of contemporary issues and, and, and that history. And I haven't seen it yet because I think their world premieres on November 10th, but it should be an interesting one. And I think we're gonna hopefully try to get that to UMass Lowell next year. So watch that space and, and, and maybe some of the libraries here too would, might be interested in screening that film. Oh yeah, we're definitely interested in screening Dawnland since we heard about it from Anna, Wan, Anna Wan's talk. And then also um, this new one, Bounty, I just wanted to mention also that Christine shared the 
the link for that um, film, Christine, um, sorry, I don't have your full, Christine Malpica, um, hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, she shared the link for that film um, a couple of times during in the chat there. So if anyone wants to connect to it and um, just mark it on your calendars for November 10th. Um, yeah, a it's quite of, powerful, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's an it's amazing history. It's amazing that we all it's just it's just incredible that we don't know more. Um, but I'm so it's so um, wonderful to hear about these projects that are kind of bringing these this this true history to light. Um, and Maureen and Laura both wanted a little bit of clarification about pre praying towns. Um, if you could just help us to um, understand what praying towns mean um, and. And also, um, what were some of the praying towns? Um, I think I was just reading a quick article that Newton was one. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So go ahead. So, yeah. Uh, so um, that was a bad question, you guys, because we're going to be going for half an hour now. Uh, no, it is a really complex history. So there's about 14 in uh, Massachusetts, and they're often sort of like John Elliott, the missionary. but. There's a, there's a lot of uh, work done by indigenous women uh, on the praying town. Uh, and if you're interested, like tech, uh, like email me and I'll, I'll get you the, the, the exact citations. But yes, there is sort of the missionary component, but a lot of these communities also run very much like indigenous sovereign communities. So Native Americans realize, well, by embracing Christianity, because we're surrounded by colonists, we can actually figure out ways to maintain our communities. And throughout the 1650s, through King Philip's War, it's a good strategy. And in case of like uh, the new Natick area, it, it, the community persists much longer into the 18th and early 19th century. And the remnant uh, population, I mean, a lot of the, 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 the Massachusetts Native Americans today are still sort of descendant out of these communities and they haven't left their hometowns, right? And so there's Grafton. We up in Lowell have, of course, Wamasi. Uh, and that is, I mean, that's also kind of a messed up story because like the Native Americans are given like downtown Lowell about 2,500 acres. But then Chelmsford gets the one chunk and Billerica gets the other chunk. And that, of course, also includes Lowell proper because it used to be Chelmsford and Tewksbury, uh, which was part of Billerica. So, I mean, it becomes a big land grab too for the colonists to sort of like take over land and then give Native Americans a little. Um, okay, so Claudia Fox, you just mentioned that um, around Carlisle and the most well-known is Natick. So that was her answer yeah. to that. And then Hudson also. Um, so I think Russ was asking, so and in Westford, uh, Littleton, the Nashawi community, and I think a lot of the folks there ended up in the um, on Deer Island as well, and most of them did not come back, according to sort of the local oral histories and, and, and writing. So, yeah. Wow. So we, I mean, they're like low, I mean, even in the Merrimack Valley, we have two major ones. Um, let's see, those ones were answered, okay. Oh, so, oh, now I understand the question uh, that I think it was maybe Brenna who's asked it early. I can, yeah, Brenna. I, I, I actually, I'm an immigrant to this country. So, uh, and I, I, I had a friend in college and, and she was Native American. And so I spent a lot of time uh, on, on Native American reservations that that was uh, in at that time that it was a lot in New York at the Seneca reservation Allegheny reservation in Western New York. And so that was kind of my I spent a lot of Thanksgivings with Native Americans and Christmas with Native Americans. And so that's how I became interested in this history. And when I got the job at UMass Lowell, a lot of students asked questions and sort of that's why I became more and more interested in the local history and Native American history in New England in general. And that spurred me to write this book and give these talks because um, I want people to know more about what I think is very fascinating history, but it's also important history for us uh, as a society that we need to acknowledge. Uh, uh, so that's beyond the land acknowledgement. There is a lot of uh, history that, that we need to talk about. I mean, I'm right here in a land grant institution, right? Uh, 
1862, the Morrill Act, what we don't talk, we talk about that was a land grant institution, it was awesome, right? The way that was paid for was by dispossessing a lot of Native American land, not paying Native American at all or giving them pennies on the dollar for the value of their land. And that was what financed institutions like MIT, the University of Massachusetts, Cornell, all these land grant institutions. Uh, and so when we're doing land acknowledgements, we also need to sort of look at our institutions and, and, and like, yes, the Pawtuckets and, and Panacooks uh, used to live here where my office is, but as this office is here, this is also help being built by, by all these resources and, and the Moral Act is sort of one of those things. Do you have, um, someone was asking for a reference to um, some kind of historic resources or maps that uh, that show where the American reserves were um, other than the praying towns? You mean uh, the, the, the Native American reserves in New England? Yeah, or in, I think that's what they're referring to. So, in Massachusetts, yeah. yeah. So Massachusetts is, is 1880s, it's it's Mashpee and then what is today the Aquina, and they're sort of now re-emerging. And I think the Chelmsford Library, um, like land acknowledgement, I think actually you're planning to link this up to the land purchases of the uh, of the Mashpee Wampanoag. Uh, and yes, yeah, so those were the main two in the 1860s to 1880s that were then terminated. And then, of course, there's the Narragansett in Rhode Island and the Mohegan and Pequot in, in New England. And then there are smaller, and sorry, in Connecticut, and there are smaller communities. And then there is the Maliseet up in Maine, uh, Penobscot, Pasmaquoddy. They have federally recognized uh, re reservations. And then Vermont and New Hampshire have sort of a lot of smaller Abenaki, Wabanaki communities that are sometimes state recognized, sometimes not, and they're sort of uh, very active, having incredible cultural programming, historical programming, uh, but yeah, they're they're not, they don't have that kind of recognition, and yeah, we shall see if when and if that is happening. Deb would like to know um, today if there are any Native American activist groups that could be supported that you know of, or. Um, and, and if you know um, what the current population of indigenous people in the Merrimack Valley, given that the original people either died of disease or war or fled to Maine, New Hampshire, or Vermont. Yeah, and but they also, they didn't all disappear. I mean, there's plenty of people that that's also stayed behind. Uh, so um, it's hard to gauge because again, you kind of like, how do you count? Uh, under federal law, it's only federally recognized Native Americans. And that does not fit many people of Indian heritage in New England. And so uh, you have a lot of local organizations like the Greater Lowell uh, Indian Community. Uh, uh, you, have, you have a lot of activist groups uh, that deal with the day of mourning, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think they're doing quite fine without uh, Euro-Americans. Uh, and uh, so I think having a sympathetic ear and being aware of the history and where these communities coming from goes a long way. I think Aina Sweetnam um, just shared a link also, if folks would like to contribute to contemporary efforts by the indigenous people of this area to buy back some of their land, please check out the recently launched Bomazine Land Trust. And then they shared the um, link for that as well in the chat. Um, do you, how long have the uh, family separations been going on for? And again, this is sort of post Igua or before. So this is really going on throughout the 20th century. And then some of the congressional hearings and Donland starts the documentary out with that. Uh, it sort of goes up until the 1970s, unless it's the state of Maine, then they continue into the 2000s. Um, so yes, it's a, it's really kind of a 20th century, and in a sense, I mean, it it becomes it already starts uh, with the boarding schools because I mean you're taking Native American children 
I mean, are they students or are they hostages? I mean, they're like taken out of the communities that have been recently quote unquote pacified and you take people's children. Um, it, it becomes quite a, a, a pressure on, on indigenous communities not, not to further resist and to sort of um, surrender. Uh, and so, yes, it's, yeah. And it, it's a continuation of that. And it's a very depressing uh, story because when you, when you talk to survivors and you also understand um, sort of the continuation of trauma through generations, it's, it's, it's quite incredible. We have a lot of very um, engaging discussion happening in the chat uh, between some other people who are very engaged with this issue or, or these, this topic. And so I am gonna save this chat as well and send it out to everybody afterwards, as well as the recording um, tonight. So thank you, for, thank you for sharing all of these great resources and um, helping to clarify some of these answers because there are so many <laughs> comments. Um, Russ would like to know what, um, what efforts are being taken at the University of Lowell to educate students about contemporary Native Americans in the Merrimack Valley, apart from your classes, of course, and your writing. Um, and are indigenous people living in the area invited to talk to students? Yeah, I mean, if, if you wanna come talk to my classes anytime, right? Uh, now we've, we've just had an event uh, co-sponsored with uh, NACO, the Native American Cultural Organization for which I am the faculty advisor and GLICA, the Greater Lowell Indian Community Association. We're trying to do that. We just had an indigenous walking tour that we did with Tom Liddy, Libby, the chief of, the, of GLICA. And so, yeah, we're, we're trying, we're not perfect. Uh, we've had a couple of movie events. Uh, and so, yes, we're trying to do more with Indigenous Peoples Day. And, uh, and, and Native American History Month now. And it's also important that we do this beyond those two months. I mean, as Anna Juan said last two weeks ago, it's quite exhausting and it really is. Um, but we also, and that's not the only issue we need to focus on either. So I think there is a lot of issues of, of equity and inclusion. And, and a lot of times I think it's just about being nice and trying to listen and also just trying to learn and uh, yeah so and having a little bit of an open mind and i think that's a bit counterintuitive to the day and age where there's a lot of shrill screaming about a lot of things <clears throat> well i think most of um the rest of the chat was all kind of information backing up what you were saying and also clarifying some other things for people and sharing some great resources. So I'm going to save that. But um, would you mind if I shared your email address? Um, no, no, and you can, people? yeah, you can they... find me on the inter internet too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, um, there's Leslie asked which indigenous people lived in the Chelmsford area. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. So, yeah. yeah, no, so that it, it, this is kind of a hard question. So usually they're identified as Penacook or Pawtucket. Uh, and uh, yeah, so to answer that, but it's also kind of hard when you have like 90% of the population dying in the 16th and, 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 and especially then in the 17th century, that must have been a collapse of society. So what we call today Massachusetts or Penacook or Nipmuc, uh, what they called themselves and what mortality did to them is, is for me very, I mean, we tend to like use, yeah. So I think that there's just so much we don't understand, Leslie, but that's a very good question. But usually it, it's Penacook or Pawtucket. And then Nancy writes, would you say uh, the New England equivalent of Indian boarding school was the praying towns? Yeah, the boarding school picture it is in New York State. Yeah, there's a Nancy. There's another good uh, documentary on that particular boarding school. It's called Unseen Tears, uh, and I think you can find that on YouTube right now. It used to be on Amazon. They took it off, but now it's for free on YouTube. Um, well, I mean, New England had its own boarding school experiment. I mean, we have like Harvard College. We have Dartmouth College, which kind of used Native Americans as a money maker, and then it became a school for white rich kids. Um, um, but so there have been efforts in New England uh, in the 18th century to start boarding schools, and Native Americans were pretty resistant to that. 
And, um, and, and given the, 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 the role that Christianity and, and, uh, and, uh, and indigenous ministers play in the communities as educators, um, um, I think they try to keep their kids within the community. Um, so, but the, the other question I think was, can we compare the boarding schools to praying towns? Uh, I'm not entirely sure if that's a, a, a good comparison. I mean, it, it's, it's a mission in, in many ways, but we also have to remember um, that like there was John Elliott and then there was Daniel Gukin and they had to manage 14 praying towns. So according to like my research, they showed up maybe in the greater Lowell area once or twice a year. Because it's a long trip. I mean, we drive it in an hour, I understand. But back in the day, that was like a day long trip of marching up and under often difficult conditions. So on in the in the in the praying towns, they they became ways for indigenous people to very much uh, maintain their sovereignty and trying to survive in, in an increasingly hostile colonial world. So they also became a little bit of a of a safety blanket in that in, in that in that. Uh, in that regard. So I think that answered the ones in the Q&A. So there was one comment that came through and I'm, I'm curious, I'm, I do know if there's um, a good deal of effort. It's been, I've, I've not been in the public schools um, for a very long time, but um, if there's much of an effort in, um, in with Massachusetts social study curriculum, studies curriculum to, to provide more clarity as to the, the truth of the history of Native American people in, in New England? That's a, that's a very difficult question. And I, I think there is more stuff on Massachusetts history, especially in the, in the primary school. But I also think from talking to teachers, a lot of them feel very unprepared to teach the subject matter because they just haven't been trained. I've been having a lot of students in my Native Americans that are aspiring educators. And I've been like volunteering my time just like with libraries to like give teachers workshops too. Uh, and so um, I, think, uh, I think there's a lot of interest among teachers to learn more and the tools aren't necessarily there. And like the, the Commonwealth gives you sort of like a state framework but doesn't really provide you with the resources to, to teach that subject matter and then um, yeah, so, and then there's also the issues of equity, right? Uh, some people can bring in indigenous spe speakers because they have the resources, other schools don't. And so, it, again, there's a lot of, it's a very good question and it's a very important question and it's really something that we have to figure out and do a better job. But I also feel like a lot of teachers are trying very hard and they just don't have the tools. Yeah, um, Raymond commented that invisibility of Native people fuels bias and racism in schools, media, the courts, and even in Congress, 75% of polled people know nothing about Native people in current society. Yep. Very sad, very sad. Um, this is a, a, a really great step, I would say, this talk tonight. Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing that, oh, oh, great, Jillian! I'm, another, another like uh, mascot got dumped. Yes. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, Pentucket Regional High School has dumped Satchin as its mascot. Yeah. Oh, and, and lots of there's love. There's been lots of blowback over that. Yes, and then yes, the Upstander Project has great resources, not only for the Dawnland but also the Bounty Project. Check that out. Uh, Misha's done a really nice job with that stuff. Uh, she is like, I mean, she is an incredible researcher, uh, very gifted academic that can also uh, make things apply to, um, to, to educators and their needs. And then before I forget, um, Beverly has her hand raised. I'm just gonna allow her to talk if she still yeah. has a question. Yeah, absolutely. And then Jillian, yes, the state is moving to get rid of the high school. And that is correct. And we shall see how that goes. Just like the state seal, it seems to be good movements, but then time will tell. Beverly, sorry. It looks like she put her hand down. So I'm okay. going to um, 
let's see. So, um, okay, and then someone else had their hand up. If you still have your hand up, nope, they seem to have put it down now too. Yeah, and, and Ray, you're you're absolutely correct. Uh, there there is a not a lot of need. Uh, Nipma country, Pentecost country, uh, everywhere. There really is. Thank you for that point. Well, thank you, Dr. Strobel, for your time tonight. Um, we my, really, my pleasure. Really appreciate it. And I will send out this recording to everybody as well as the chat. And um, thank you again. And everybody, and I will try to gather all the resources from the chat too. And everyone's saying great job and thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming out. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night.